Hello again, everyone. My name is Janelle Hazard, and I am the executive director and curator at Tefra Institute of Contemporary Art. Welcome. Thank you again for joining us. We are excited for tonight's creative response program for the exhibition Mother Line, which features work by photographer, filmmaker, video and performance artist Lola Nakadante. This exhibition is presented in partnership with George Mason University and is guest curated by Lily Siegel and Donald Russell. And the program tonight is sponsored by Reston Community Center. I see Sherry in the audience. Hi, Sherry. Uh, thank you also to the sponsors of Tefra ICA, which include Arts Fairfax, Virginia Commission for the Arts, the National Endowment for the Arts, and hello and thank you to all of our board members who are joining us tonight. We also want to acknowledge the original stewards of the areas known today as Reston and Northern Virginia and the surrounding areas in the Washington DC region, which include the Piscataway peoples and the Manahawk peoples, as well as the diverse and vibrant native communities who make their home here today. Um, all right, so I mentioned that this exhibition is presented in partnership with GMU. And as part of that, a concurrent exhibition titled Mother will be on view at Mason's exhibition Arlington Gallery beginning on March 25th. And Mother is the third iteration of a group exhibition co-organized by Laurel, which was first shown at the Leslie Takanao Artworks Projects in New York in 2018. Mother explores the idea of motherhood from a diversity, from a diverse perspective of um, different women. And there's a lot to look forward to when it comes to upcoming program, including the next program, which is with George Mason University and their Visual Voices series where Laurel will present a lecture around her work and practice. And that will take place on February 24th, I believe. And so we're honored to host Laurel's work in these exciting upcoming programs. And without further ado, I will introduce our guest for tonight, Marina Isgro. Marina Isgro is Associate Curator of Media and Performance Art at the Hirshhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden. She is curator of the current exhibition, Lori Anderson, The Weather, which runs through July 31st and the forthcoming exhibition, John Akamafra, called Purple, which opens on October 27th. She also co-organized co the year-long film and video series, Viewfinder, which featured screenings and conversations with women across the Smithsonian collections, including Laurel Nakadante. At the Hirshhorn, she oversees the museum's holdings of film and video, digital art, and performance art. She received her PhD in art history from the University of Pennsylvania. Please join me in welcoming Marina Isbro. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks so much, Janelle. So as Janelle mentioned, my name is Marina Isbro. I'm a curator at the Hirshhorn. Um, before I get started, I just want to give a few thank yous first to Janelle and Jordan for the invitation and for uh, coordinating the talk tonight. Um, and then I also want to thank Laurel and Lily and Dawn for putting together a really beautiful show that I was lucky to see in person a couple of weeks ago. So bear with me, I'm going to share my screen um, and get started. Okay, um, so can everyone see that? Yeah, great. So I first got to know Laurel Nakadati's work in 2011 when she had an exhibition at MoMA PS1. Um, at that time, she was primarily making videos, including several in which she recruited single middle-aged men to join her in performances like Dancing to Songs by Britney Spears. Um, one of those early videos is actually in the Hirshhorn's collection. Um, and I recently included it in Viewfinder, that online screening series of work by women across the Smithsonian. Um, I was really fortunate at that time to have Laurel and Lily come speak and was thrilled to learn more about Laurel's recent work in photography. Um, for me, it's been really exciting to see how this work kind of extends her interest in vulnerability and intimacy into new directions. So today I'll be discussing two of the photographic series on view in Mother Line called Relations and the Kingdom. I'd like to think about both of these series in the context of the history of photography, particularly the history of what we might call collective portraiture. Throughout, I'll also make reference to women's histories of photography and look at how Laurel fits specifically into those traditions or that mother line. 
Um, I'll speak for about 20 or 25 minutes, and then I'm very curious to hear your thoughts and have a discussion. And I know Laurel is also with us tonight. So I am going to begin with the relations series, which Laurel began in 2013. She submitted a DNA sample to 23andMe and used the service to locate distant relatives who ended up being primarily from her mother's side. Um, her father is Japanese American and his family has been in the US for a shorter period of time. Um, so she just received very few matches from that side. Laurel reached out to over a thousand of these people and asked to take their photographs. Um, several hundred responded and she set about traveling to take their pictures ultimately crisscrossing more than 30,000 miles back and forth across the US. She photographed these people in a uniform style at night in very dark locations near their homes, using a flashlight to illuminate their figures. So at the gallery, these are displayed as large sea prints. I think the largest ones are about three by five feet and I'll show you a few of those images here. Um, so here we're seeing a young woman in Carolina Beach, North Carolina, a family in Longwood, Florida. And in this one, you can really see um, how landscape becomes kind of an important part of the series with these silhouetted palm trees. A man in Coleman, Alabama, holding a, a rifle for his portrait. A young woman in Akron, Ohio and uh, a man in Happy Valley, Oregon, who has chosen to pose with a doctor's white coat and stethoscope. So when I've heard Laurel speak about this body of work and the related star portraits series, she has mentioned the photographer, Mike Disfarmer as a reference point. So I thought we could um, start by digging into that a little bit. So Disfarmer was a photographer who moved to the small town of Haber Springs, Arkansas, when he was about 30 years old. He constructed a photography studio there and offered portrait photos at an affordable rate. So people would visit to commemorate birthdays, anniversaries, family reunions, and so on. Disfarmer was kind of a loner. He never married, never had children. And after he died in 1959, his studio sat vacant for years until his photography was rediscovered in the 1970s. Um, and at that point, his work began to be celebrated within the art world. So less as vernacular studio photography and more as artistic portraiture. The photographs themselves are pretty straightforward, um, but also show a kind of identifiable style. The subject's expressions are mostly serious, even solemn. This farmer would sometimes make a loud sound or produce a flash of light at the moment of capture, um, giving people almost a shocked look in some of these. But I think the power of these photographs also comes um, from seeing them together as a whole body of work. When we step back in that way, we can see how this farmer essentially created a collective portrait of a town. So here we're seeing a portrait of Mary Stone Bullard and her nine daughters a portrait of a man and a boy uh, who have chosen to pose with a dead deer, a young couple, and a portrait of two boys. Another uh, well-known example of what we might call collective portraiture is the work of August Sonder. Um, Sonder was a German photographer who started off like this farmer running a portrait studio. Um, but then in the 1910s, he abandoned the studio and began to travel by bicycle, finding people to photograph along the roads outside of Cologne. That practice grew into a decades long project in which he tried to create a picture of German society through its citizens. Um, so Sondra would classify people by profession or class, really looking to find types um, like the farmer type or the painter type. Um, I'll show you a few here. These are three young farmers. These are circus people, it's one of my favorites. Middle-class children. And an amazing photo of a pastry cook. Um, so although he claimed to be photographing um, categories rather than individuals, you can see how there's this really beautiful sensitivity and detail to each one of the subjects. So there are also more contemporary examples of this kind of collective portraiture. Um, in the 1970s and 80s, Nan Golden, 
who had a complicated relationship with her birth family, began to photograph her close friends and what she called her chosen family. In her words, she said they were, quote, bonded not by blood or place, but by a similar morality, the need to live fully and for the moment. So I'm showing you some examples here. They have a raw snapshot-like quality, often shot with flash in dark nightclubs. And again, like the previous two examples, Golden's projects took on an epic scale. Uh, most famously, she included 700 portraits in a slideshow called The Ballad of Sexual Dependency. So I think we can situate Laurel's work within this tradition. Um, like this farmer, she is issuing invitations to strangers to be photographed. The subjects choose how to present themselves to the camera, um, selected clothes, props and poses that are meaningful to them. Like Saunders, she is an itinerant photographer who travels to different locations to encounter people. And like him, she incidentally creates a portrait of a country and its landscapes along the way. Um, I found it telling that the titles of her photographs in the series refer to the names of the places rather than the people in them. Um, like Golden, she takes an expanded approach to defining what constitutes a family, and her project is highly personal. Um, in a way, she creates a self-portrait while photographing others. Um, for me, what really stands out in the relations portraits and makes them so distinct is the kind of trust and intimacy that we can sense on both sides of the lens. Um, these are really isolated settings that both Laurel and her subjects visited alone at night um, to meet a stranger connected only through the most tenuous really of ties. Um, of course, that vulnerability is there in the images featuring young children, even this little baby. Um, and what you see in the adult subjects faces isn't the kind of wariness that you might expect in this situation, but a complicity or openness to the camera and to Laurel's gaze. Um, like this woman with her dog and this one with her mini horses, which I absolutely love. Um, so I think the series shares a tender quality with Laurel's work in general, which is that it points to a fundamental generosity in human nature that makes us want to connect with other people to give them kind of the benefit of the doubt. So going back to that question of collective portraiture. Um, there's one last comparison that I wanna make here that is quite different from um, these really epic projects of, of Dis Farmer, Sander and Golden. And that is the popular tradition of the family album. Um, as you may know, photography was invented in around 1839. And we start to see albums emerging in the 1850s and becoming very popular from the 1860s onwards. Um, from the beginning, it's really been women who manage these albums, who collect, classify, and share photographs with the people in their families and social circles. Recent scholarship in art history and social history has started to take the family album more seriously, looking at its role in defining the shape and boundaries of the modern family from the late 19th century onward. Women who assembled these albums had to make decisions about how to frame and delimit the family and the circle. So who gets included, who doesn't? How are constituent members and relationships represented? So I think we can also see Laurel working in the tradition of the family album or a vernacular family photography, but she's pulling it into a really interesting and unexpected direction. She is stretching the notion of family so broadly, defining it through genes shared possibly centuries ago and putting pressure on this boundary between stranger and relative. It's almost the opposite of golden. Um, so the project is not about family that you've consciously chosen, but incidental family, people connected to you through these accidents of history. So I'd like you to keep this idea of the album in mind as I transition to the next body of work in the Tepper show, uh, which is called The Kingdom. This is a series of 34 photographs that is being shown in its entirety for the first time in this exhibition. Um, as you can see, their scale is much smaller and more intimate than relations. 
These are closer to the size of the snapshots from which they're drawing their source material. So you really need to get up close and personal um, to view them. So in 2016, Laurel's mother died shortly before the artist gave birth to her son. And the two were sadly never able to meet. Um, the way Laurel tells this story, during that time, she had been receiving spam emails from a company offering Photoshop services. And the subject line of these emails was, we can fix anything. Laurel had the idea to hire this company to Photoshop images of her infant son into the arms of her mother, creating photorealistic documents of an event that Laurel had badly wanted to happen, but that had actually never come to pass. So I'll walk through a few of those images here. As you'll see, um, some are more convincing than others. In some, the illusion sort of more or less holds. And in others, there's a very clear collage effect. So in this one, we really see the seams uh, where the mother's hands meet the baby's body. And they sort of seem to float over him rather than supporting his weight. In this one, the baby's head is disproportionately large and kind of held unconvincingly upright. Um, you can also see the sharpness of the more recent photograph um, against the kind of soft graininess of the older one. Here again, the editor has laid the baby over the mother's body without adding any shadows or indentations to indicate his body making contact with hers. Um, in this one, you can really see how the sort of adorable chunky baby legs are just cut out of the original photo and pasted on. Um, and I find these sort of more flawed examples really poignant because they make explicit the impossibility of this desire to have these two people actually physically together. Um, so Photoshop is obviously a contemporary development, but there is a long history of image manipulation that dates back almost to the birth of photography. From the beginning, this claim of photography as objective truth, the idea that photos depict only um, you know, what the camera sees without the intervention of the human hand has coexisted with a huge variety of ways to edit and manipulate images, whether that's in camera, at the negative stage or later. The history of image manipulation, along with the cutout or collage quality in many of the kingdom images, got me thinking about a body of early photographic collages produced almost exclusively by women. There was a phenomenon in the 1860s. Again, this is only about 20 years, maybe after photography was invented, um, in which upper class Victorian women combined photography with watercolor to produce really imaginative images of their friends, family, and public figures arranged in personal albums. Normally, they didn't produce the photos themselves. They cut them out from carte de visite, which were these calling cards um, featuring portrait photos that could be either traded among your friends or you could purchase them you know, of famous people at shops. And if we walk through a few of these photo collages together, I think we'll see there are some similar impulses at play in their work as in Laurel's. All right, so some of these are completely surreal. Um, so in these two, we see women pasting their own heads and those of their friends onto animals, a flock of ducks on the left, um, a bird and a tortoise on the right. Women could place themselves in fantastical settings. Um, there are examples set in sort of fairy worlds or hot air balloons, or even public, excuse me, public locations that were accessible only to men at the time. Um, but others feature more everyday backdrops and show women using the medium of photo collage to construct desired or ideal social situations. So in many of them, the creators arranged photographs of real or aspirational guests in their own homes with themselves at the center, um, producing these really complicated blends of fact and fiction. So one scholar has written that in these Victorian albums, quote, the Prince of Wales was free to walk into young women's bedrooms and able to appear as prince, king, or object of desire, social or otherwise, in anyone's album. So what we can see in these collages are women shaping their worlds kind of according to their own fantasies. So here we're looking at a scene by an artist, Lady Filmer, 
Um, she can actually be seen in the back here making photographic collages and pasting them into an album um, surrounded by her friends and family. Wall hung portraits depict the family lineage behind her. Uh, her husband, Sir Edmund Filmer, is the tiny guy in the right hand corner sitting next to his dog. And the large man at the very center of the composition is actually Albert Edward, the Prince of Wales. Um, so Lady Filmer and the Prince apparently had kind of a flirtatious relationship and his size and position in this composition, um, especially compared to her husband are pretty telling. Another one that I'll share um, is from an album by Alexandra, Princess of Wales. She was born into kind of a, a relatively humble, marginal branch of the royal family, but through a series of chance events became the Princess of Denmark and eventually married the Prince of Wales. This is the same guy, Albert, who we just saw in Lady Filmer's drawing room. She started to create these elaborate photo collages um, in the early years of her marriage that show her trying to make sense of her new social world. So she created several just like this set in her own drawing room. We see her visualizing herself at the center, um, posed as an accomplished hostess to a group of very dignified guests. Um, again, the message here is that she was fit to be the future queen. In another image from the album, she's going way into the realm of fantasy, um, showing different images of herself and her five children lounging inside flowers and mushrooms. Um, so in addition to the obviously very whimsical setting, um, there are other elements of the surreal here. You know, we're seeing more than five children. Actually, these are images of the same children at different ages coexisting alongside each other in this space. Um, so there's this really interesting tension in these collages between the highly objective, this new documentary medium of photography and the completely fantastical. Um, but photography seems to pull the fantasy toward the factual to give these women's dreams and aspirations uh, a kind of real weight. So if you are as fascinated by these as I am, I would highly recommend a book called Playing with Pictures, the Art of Victorian Photo Collage um, that was put out a few years ago by the Art Institute of Chicago. But going back to Laurel's work, um, what I want to get at with this comparison is that there is a long history of women manipulating photography to explore alternative or desired social relationships. As in Laurel's work, they used photography to do the impossible, to collapse time, to bring images from different moments into spatial proximity, to place photographs of people taken years apart in the same room, even people who may have died or people who one has never met. And that uh, brings me to one of my favorite aspects of the kingdom, which is the sort of time traveling quality that the series has when viewed as a whole. Uh, throughout, Laurel's son stays roughly the same age, um, while Laurel's mother ages from a girl to an older woman in a wheelchair. So here, here she is as a girl. And in the last of the photos, number 34, um, toward the end of her life. We also see Laurel with her baby long before Laurel gave birth, and Laurel's mother with the baby even before Laurel existed in some of the early ones. So to conclude, I'd like to uh, bring this back to the present. Um, I am of an age where I sort of straddled two eras of photography. I grew up looking at my parents' family albums, and I made my own printed photo albums about through my teenage years. Um, but at some point, those started disappearing, and this practice of carefully selecting, arranging, labeling, preserving photographs in physical form has just become much rarer. Now we have thousands of photographs that we can access at any moment on our phones and that rarely, if ever, get printed. Many of us went through a phase of creating Facebook albums, uh, which tried to be the digital analog of the printed album or we rely on our Instagram feeds as a kind of ongoing album. There is a transience and contingency to these albums that seems new. I've noticed that um, younger people, Gen Z especially, tend to delete and recurate and shape their feeds as they grow and wanna emphasize certain images of themselves over others. In many ways, the public nature of the photo album has intensified. 
as images are made available for likes and comments as soon as they are posted. This phenomenon has led some scholars to speak about a shift from the traditional binary between personal and collective memory to a kind of hybrid called connected memory. But it's also important to remember that the album or the collective portrait has always served as a social space, uh, that photographs have the power to do things, not just to show things. Photo albums from the beginning have been a space for connection in which individuals can craft and communicate a certain image of themselves and their relationship to others and to transmit a history uh, from one generation to the next. Or as one scholar has written of Nan Golden's collective portrait of her community, it quote, participated in the creation of the reality it sought to document. So I think Laurel's photographs also do things. Uh, the relations project, as I understand it, is as much about producing relationships among related strangers through the process of reaching out, meeting, interacting, creating some kind of social web that wasn't there before. In Laurel's telling, some of those relationships were fleeting um, and others continue to last today. The images in the kingdom, meanwhile, document relationships that never existed, but these documents seem to lodge themselves in our heads, almost creating new memories of an alternative history. Some scholars have used the term contact zone to talk about photography in this way, as a means to engage with others, to construct communities, and to interact with them. So I think I'll end there with this idea that Laurel's photographs are things that act and that the ways they do so are part of a long tradition in photography, much of which has been directed by women. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marina. Thank it you. has been such a pleasure to hear your perspective and experiences as they relate to your own research and practice as a curator, so thank you. Um, uh, we'll begin to open up for Q&A if people would like to begin dropping questions into the chat. Um, I'll just share that I personally really enjoyed the idea of the comparing Laurel's work in relation to the sort of vernacular of the family photo album. I never thought of it that way. You know, women really owning the responsibility of that object with the upkeep and adding to it. And then the exploration of Victorian figures and real versus aspirational and the historical photo collages um, and the idea of women shaping their worlds like walking away with that because that statement is very powerful and real um, thank you so much Jala. let's see do we have any questions yet don russell's here with us he's the other guest curator in partnership with lily siegel hi don he says brilliant talk oh thanks don <laughs> You're awesome. I know. Oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say, I know Laurel's here too, not to put her on the spot. That's right. <laughs> if anyone has questions for her too. Absolutely, Laurel's here. She's waving to everyone. If you have any questions for Laurel as well, she's open to say hello and address those questions with Marina. I can also just kick it off maybe with a question for Laurel, which is, I mean, I've heard you mention Dis Farmer, as I said, as a reference, but I'm curious, like, who else were you actually thinking about when you worked on these series? What's so funny is yeah. that you brought up Nan Golden, and I don't think you and I have ever discussed Nan Golden. I don't think we yeah. have. We never have. <laughs> no. but, you know, she's someone whose work was always extremely important to me. Um, and we happened to go to the same college, obviously, different times but we studied with the same teachers. No um, way. Yeah, and it, yeah, it's interesting. You know, the Boston School, the Boston Photo School, the Museum of Fine Arts, the School of the Museum of Fine Arts produced a lot of photographers actually, right? Like Nan Golden, P.L. de Corsia, Starn Twins, um, Todd Heido, um, just tons and tons of photographers have gone through the School of Museum of Fine Arts. And I happened to also go through there and she was, a huge influence on me as an early, as a young photographer. Um, you know, the idea that you could build a world with people and create a family album, the idea that you could um, use the camera to give you access to spaces, the way that, you know, all of these things that she was thinking about, I, 
I took in so wholly as a young student studying with many of the people who taught her. So yeah. um, it's so strange that you brought her up. <laughs> First of all, the talk was amazing. Thank you. For oh, thank it. you. Thanks for listening. Connections and care that you made there. Um, I, it's, I think it's the first time I've ever gotten to witness someone talk about my work, which um, is, I thought was going to be really strange, but actually I just felt such gratitude the whole time. Oh. You were talking. <laughs> it's like, I felt very seen. I felt very like, right. And, and these are all, you know, things I think about. And as I made the work, these were all like hopes of mine, but to hear someone actually say they saw that in the work is very moving for me. So thank you. And I love the connections. Um, I had never thought about the, you know, Victorian, the, the women making these like Victorian cutouts and like reimagining their lives. I love the one of the, like moving her husband to the side. <laughs> that one was amazing. Like you can go sit with the dog, okay? I know, and there are so many of those. I mean, I picked like four, but I have a book of like a hundred of them on my desk right now. <laughs> and it's like not different from teenagers cutting out movie stars and putting yeah. them on the walls and like making, you know, like imagining the worlds they want to imagine by surrounding themselves with images that make them yeah. feel like they're participating in that experience. Experience, right and um even like dis farmer right like teenagers would go to dis farmer on the weekends to be photographed with their friends as if they were going to like a photo booth or as if they were like holding up a camera for selfies pre-selfies right um and I think about that all the time that sort of teenagers wanting to be witnessed in order to feel that their experiences are valid or or that they're happening that it's even happening at all right that like pictures or it didn't happen like goes back to dis farmer so um I love you know, like I just like love that idea too I think all the time about like the fact that dis farmer was the one making those pictures of the teenagers like I know it's weird, something right yeah. <laughs> like this kind of like person who was kind of kept to himself like and then these like teenagers would like I just imagine that scene of them like storming into the studio, like laughing on a Friday to be witnessed by this person. Um, but I love that. Like, I love the complication of that. And I love like his participation in that process. Um, yeah. Well, we do have a question from Hannah Barco, who's actually our associate curator. Hi, Hannah, you can unmute yourself. Hi, yeah. Um, well, first of all, thank you, Laurel, for your work. It's been a wonderful honor to help um, make it happen in the gallery. And Marina, your talk really was fabulous in giving some further insights and um, those legacies, right, and those female legacies that you see this work as part of. One of the things that you touched on at the end about what the photographs do, um, especially in the Kingdom series, struck a chord with something that I've been sitting with and kind of pondering, which is what does it become to see this woman's life pass sort of before the camera with this child at every step of the way? And I think that resonates for me in relationship to my own current experience, which is that I have a two and a half year old, right? And so it's like, it's all about the baby and society tells me it's all about the baby, right? And this particular kind of version of motherhood, um, it's like, well, it's a person, right? But that that baby doesn't become a person before our eyes, but this woman does and her life, she changes so much. So I just, sorry, this is a comment, but I'm curious to hear from, from each of you more about what you think you know, Laurel, in some ways that might be not where the work came from and you're making it, but what the set of images become as this portrait of a woman always with a baby, right? And, and I'm curious, Marina, how you might connect to that either in the examples you've shared with us, which are amazing, or other kind of histories of photo and thinking about the picturing of the woman with a child, right? <laughs> And, really and, and what do we do when we now, we have this Madonna who's, right, like at the beach, but then also, you know, with the sunset in the wheelchair and these really different phases of life being mother or grandmother, right, um, with the child. 
Yeah. I mean, as I said, that's really one of my favorite parts of the work too, is seeing this discrepancy between the baby who's always the same and the mother who's changing. Um, and I described it, I think, as like a time traveling, but actually it's like in each photograph, it's almost like an alternative history opening up. Mm -hmm. You know, like what if yeah. the baby were there when she was 17? What if the baby were there when she was 30? You know, it's it's these glimpses into like possible lives maybe that didn't happen that way, but could have. Um, but I'm curious to hear from Laurel about this because it's very personal for you, obviously. Yeah, it's it's interesting. Like when I finished the series and it was this sort of like long ongoing relationship I had with this stranger on the internet, sending these pictures, you know, two pictures at a time and then receiving the result. <clears throat> like it was a relationship that I started having with the stranger. And a couple of things surprised me as I finished the project, which was, one that I felt like it was done at a certain point. Like I didn't really know when it would finish, but when it felt done to me is when it felt like it represented a spanning of my mother's life, like spanning the years of my mother's life. Um, I surprised myself in that I wanted it to feel like we time traveled with her. I wanted you to sort of see her from young girl to the end of her life. Um, the pictures for me are as much about the longing that was created in trying to bring together the two images of these two people, as it was about talking about a woman's life in snapshots or a woman's life in vernacular photography, right? A woman's life as witnessed by those around her over the course of her life. So um, that became clear to me. And that was the moment I realized that I had completed the series. Um, so what was the second part of that question? There were both very great parts of the question. I think I only answered half. I think part of it was also about the sort of history of depicting mothers or women with children yeah. in photography, which you can probably answer better than I can. Yeah, it's interesting because I think that we all feel that our mothers or our family members are so singular, right? And so I wasn't thinking about that when I put the work together because I was simply thinking, I mean, I was in this sort of like free fall of grief when I made this project. I wasn't like, I had a very young child and my mother had just died, you know, like I was just kind of getting through every day, day by day. Um, and I made this work in my son's room, like at the foot of his bed, quietly emailing these pictures to a stranger because it was the only work that I could make when I was like, when I had a one-year-old, you know, um, my whole practice had to change when he was born. Um, and so I wasn't really thinking about this idea, this image of the Madonna. I really wasn't, and it's so obvious I should have been, I really should have been, right? But I think I was in such like free fall that I was just thinking about my own mother. And I know that's like not the right art historical answer, but it really was just so selfish. It was like, or self-centered, right? Like I am just in my grief, just wanting to make this work trying to like be an artist in the quiet foot of like my foot bed, the, bed the, the foot of the bed of my kid's room, you know? And I'm sure other parents will like recognize that sort of urgent kind of work when your child sleeps thing. Um, yeah, I mean, I think for me, they, they feel very individual and very personal and they don't, I mean, you know, there are some famous images like Dorothea Lange, the sort of migrant mother that feel like the woman and child read as symbols almost. Mm -hmm. And I don't feel that in this work. They feel very specific to the people right. depicted. And then I right. think the other, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, yeah. you go ahead. <laughs> no, I was just thinking the other thing about them is just the relationship between the two figures is just always very strange because they weren't originally in the same space. Mm -hmm. So like the mother's not looking at the child, you know, or not paying attention at all to the child or just holding him in a weird way. And so there's something there that's also kind of disrupting these conventional representations of motherhood for me. I would have loved to have been able to watch the person photoshopping them together and like understand what they were thinking or feeling when they did that. Like, wouldn't it be interesting to, to ask them what they thought about this process? Like, Early on, they would write me and say, your request is too difficult. This is impossible. And I agreed and I knew it was too difficult and impossible, but not for the reasons they thought it was difficult and impossible. For them, it was just that it was beyond their Photoshop skill level, um, like no drop shadow treat, uh, skill yet. Um, but 
you know, for me, of course, I knew it was impossible. So, um, but partway through, they stopped telling me things were too hard and they just started responding with the outcome. And I think by the end, they either had gotten just really tired of dealing with me um, or they had understood what the assignment was, I mm -hmm. think, maybe. Um, I, at some point, I hoped that they would ask me a question about her or that they would, you know, ask me why I wanted this, but maybe it was just a job for them. Maybe they just wanted the job. I, you know, I'll never know. I'll never know. Yeah. Do you know if it was always the same person or multiple people? I don't know. Like I was looking at the Photoshop and I feel like some are better than others. And so part of me thinks it might've been a team and it seems unlikely that a single person was sending out spam emails to people asking, <laughs> you know what I mean? Asking to be hired for Photoshop services. Yeah. Like my, my thinking, it was probably a team of people or at least a small group of people. Um, but the sort of choices made feel different to me across the series of 34 images. Like, and some of them are quite good. Like mm -hmm. there's one towards the end that is actually quite good. Um, some toward the beginning or not. I, I don't know, maybe they like pushed my request to someone else at a certain point because the earlier person like didn't understand that how to put the hand, I don't know. But then of course, like the amazing ones are the ones where it's like terrible, right? The sort of failure of it in a way that the problem can't be solved, right? Um, the last image, number 34, is the one where she's in the wheelchair and he's a newborn, like really newborn. Um, and they, the person doing the Photoshop put their hands together. And that was a moment for me where I realized somewhere, somewhere, someone somewhere in the world had placed my child's hand in my mother's hand. Somewhere, someone recognized that I wanted this human connection to happen and they made it happen. So um, it just, it, it was as much as like this participation with the stranger of witnessing my life in some way, maybe. Yeah. Well, thank you both. Um, we have another question in the chat. And if anyone has other questions, close for free, please feel free to add them. You'll probably hear my kids in the background, actually. <laughs> um, so the question is actually from Robert Gowdy, who's our board chair at Tefra. And he says, there is an obvious fantasy, or in other cases, a deep authenticity in the work you discussed tonight. But photography today is often used to punk people, if you will. Infamously, the picture plane, the picture of the plane flying into the World Trade Center with the individual in the image and apparently not so obvious fake to many people. The staging a powerful force in Laurel's hand arguably is undermining photography as a genuine form of art in the modern world for some. I wonder if you can comment on that. And I think that's posed to Marina, but Laurel, if you wanna answer as well, you're welcome. Yeah, I can start us off. I mean, you know, it's it's really complicated because there was a manipulation being used in photography from the beginning. And there are some like really interesting hoaxes. Um, there was one called, I think the Cottingley Fairy hoax, like in the 19 teens where these teenage girls were supposedly photographing fairies in their gardens and, and people really believed them, you know? Um, there was a there was a show a couple years ago at the Met, I think it was called Faking It which is about this history of image manipulation sort of pre Photoshop. So that history is really fun to look into if you wanna go down a rabbit hole, but it's true that I think now it's really intensified and that's largely because of sort of the distribution channels, social media. Um, and also like there's something about the deep fake videos that's like a whole other level of <laughs> deceptive. I mean, so I guess the question is, is about this um, the photography is right. Yeah, I mean, I think Laurel, she is she is playing with that history of manipulation and that potential for manipulation, but kind of bending it in a different direction. It's not necessarily meant to to fool people, right? Like as we were saying, most of the images are not convincing, right. um, but it's it's this sort of like attempt, very like sincere attempt to imagine a history that, you know, we wish could have been real. 
Um, so I think it's maybe in dialogue with that conversation, but not not really playing into it fully. I don't know, Laurel, what you think. I agree. No, I think yeah. it's in dialogue. And I think, you know, I was very upfront about the failure of Photoshop or the failure of the technology driving the project. So there's never a point at which I hope people would, or that I thought people would not understand what was happening. Like we lead with the conversation saying, these are impossible photographs. They never really have them. Um, and so it's the failure of the fake that drives this piece. Um, I always talk about my work, my earlier work, people would say like, do you manipulate your images? And my rule for myself was always, I won't change any, and this is outside of the Photoshop project of my mom and my son, the kingdom. I, I wouldn't change anything in the pictures I couldn't have done in the dark room. Um, and that's not to say you're not manipulating images, right? Like changing brightness, contrast, like cropping, all of these things that you can do in an analog dark room are still very manipulative. You can change the meaning of a work simply by playing with the shadows, right? Um, so every photographer manip manipulates their work in some way. The rule for me early on was always only what I could have done in a dark room. Yeah. Thank you, Robert. It's funny, I bring it up to my stu students and they don't even know, like many of them haven't worked in a dark room, so they don't even know what that means, you know? <laughs> They don't know. They don't know. They're like, well, what's uh, in the dark room? <laughs> <laughs> well, it doesn't look like we have any other questions. Um, Marina, Laurel, is there anything you would like to sort of leave the audience with today? Or I think they should go see the show in person because as much as I can show it in uh, Zoom, you know, you really don't get a sense of the scale, um, which is so powerful in the relations images especially and I was if you haven't seen it yeah. yeah well I was going to actually ask Laurel too if she could say a little bit about the importance of the scale because I know there's some intentionality behind the size uh, of the yeah image. absolutely um so they're printed quite large actually they're sort of um, medium and large size images in the show and the reason for that is that I wanted to allow the audience to feel sort of what I felt as I stood in front of the individual when I made the photograph um, and so when you stand in the space of the gallery across from each photograph, you're actually standing probably very close to the distance I stood from each person as I mm -hmm. photographed them. And so in a way it becomes this sort of, in my mind, re-performance of the work that I made. Um, and lighting choices help participate in that performance. The darkened space of the walls help participate in that performance. Um, I often said that, you know, these photographs are documents of our first meetings, documents of these relationships, these, these first moments of meeting these strangers. Um, and the reason I used a flashlight is because we find one another in darkness with a flashlight, right? Like that's how we find people mm -hmm. in darkness is with a flashlight. And so um, as you stand in the gallery in front of these images, you have a very different experience, I think, than looking at the pictures online. So it's always important to go see the work in person, but especially with these photographs for me, it's very important to see them in person. Wonderful. Well, there you go, everyone. You have to go visit the show. Motherline's going to be on view until May 2022 of this year. And I just want to thank Marina for taking the time. And we're so honored to have you be a guest for our Creative Response Series. So thank you again. Thanks for inviting me. This was a lot of fun. Of course. And Laurel, thank you for being in conversation with Marina for a bit. That was a fun surprise. Thanks so much. For Thanks, Laurel. <laughs> Thanks, so, so again, the show will be on view until May 2022. Um, you can also visit the online viewing room at tefferica.org. Be sure to keep an eye out for the opening of the concurrent exhibition titled Mother at Mason's Exhibition Arlington beginning on March 25th. And also GMU's program, the Visual Voices series, which will feature Laurel on February 24th, just one week from today, which will also be virtual. So please stay connected with us, everyone. We're available on social media at Tefra ICA, and you can sign up for our newsletter to, newsletter to stay updated on all things Tefra. Thanks again. Good night. <laughs>